So here it says graphing y equals f of x and the y equals square root f of x. So there's two different outcomes and they look totally different. One is just kidding. One is we did on Wednesday where I gave you a parent function and then you have and then I gave you the square root function, right? But both of them had square roots. Both equations had square roots, correct? And I asked how to go from this one to this one. We agree? Today's the difference is I'm going to give you a parent function, but it won't be a radical. It'll be a linear or it'll be a quadratic. And what you're going to do is take the square root of that and what does it give you? That's what today's is. Okay? So they look very different. One is radical to radical, how to transform. One is linear quadratic piecewise function. Now take the square root of that, what happens? Okay? So we're going to look down here at this example. So here is a straight line. The line in, in front of you, it's 2x plus 1, correct? Then what I did was I took the square root of that function, correct? What went away? What part didn't happen? The negatives didn't happen. Why did the negatives not happen? It can't take the square root of a negative. 2x plus 1 was actually y, correct? Look okay, here, it says f of x, y equals 2x plus 1. Now I put all the y's under square roots, didn't I? That's all I did, correct? So every y that was negative went away because I put the y's under square roots. Not the x's under square roots. I took the y's of the previous graph, put them under square roots, and redrew, re redrew them. So if you look here, possibly if I can get a marker shot. I literally kept all my x's and I rooted my y's. Why did this one stay the same? This one's at negative 0.5 and 0. Why did it not change? Why did it remain invariant? Because the y is 0. And what did I say I did? I just keep all my x's and I root my y's, correct? If I square root 0, what is it? 0. So, I technically have xy becomes x root y, don't I? That would be my mapping of all of these. Because the y's would be rooted. Because look, I have y equals 2x plus 1. Now I'm taking the square root of 2x plus 1, which is my y. So I'm just rooting all my y's, keeping all my x's, correct? So if I took a test point, here I have negative 3 and negative 5. Oh, it's connecting them again. I would get negative 3 square root negative 5. Is that possible? No, so I wouldn't get a point there, would I? But then I took negative 0 0.5 and 0, and I filled it into mapping. I got negative 0 0.5, that's a decimal, square root 0. What's that? 0. It stays the same. It's invariant, shockingly, right? Where would another invariant point be? Where's the other place that if I take the square root of that y, it stays the same? What other y value? 1. So if you look at 0, 1, It's going to be 0, comma square root 1, which the square root of 1 is 1. So it stayed the same. So if you want between a graph of y equals x, let's say, and y equals square root x, let's say, invariant points will be when what? What did we say? Mm -hmm. Occur when y equals 0 and 1. So every time I go from a basic graph to a square root graph, I could go to wherever that original graph has y equals 0 and 1 and put dots because they're going to stay there, right? They're not going to change yet. You would have physical square roots over every single x. Yeah. So you'd have to have like function notation of like f bracket root x, which we don't do. Like, you would have to have, like, they would have to give you this. And then you would put that in for every x, right? It wouldn't affect in terms of, like, this thing, right? It wouldn't affect y. Nope, it could, you, it's um, wherever y is 1. So I could have x 2 1. It would still stay 2 1. Because my x's, if you look at mapping, my x's don't change. Only my y's get rooted. Yeah. So my x can be whatever it wants. Yeah. yeah. So wherever your y is 0 and 1, you could just immediately go in bold because those will remain invariant between a plain basic function and the square root of that function. Because you're taking the entire function and putting it under the square root. 
There's no like up or down, there's no stretches. Yeah. The whole Y is being put underneath. Now, any number you pick between 0 and 1, if you root, square root a number between 0 and 1, what happens? So square root 0.5. Take the square root of 0.5. If you square root 0.5, what happens? It gets larger. It's at like 0.7 something, isn't it? So when you take the square root of a decimal between 0 and 1, it actually gets larger. Like take the square root of 0.25. Square root of 0.25. What do you get? Yvonne? 0 0.5, so it got larger, correct? But if you take a square root of any number from 1 to infinity, they'll get smaller. Square root of 4 is 2, square root of 9 is 3, square root of 25 is 5, right? They get substantially smaller. But between 0 and 1, when you take a decimal, it actually gets larger. So that's why if you look here at 0 0.5, it actually, well, it's going to be hard because it's so tiny, but it actually bubbles out. Oh my gosh, it won't drop. So it actually comes out like this and then goes this way, because at 0.5, the, it's going to go up to 0 0.707, right? So some people will try and draw it in here and then curve it up. It doesn't. Between 0 0.5, 0 and 1, it's going to actually come up a little higher and curve out. Do you see that? But it's not going to curve past this point. Some people will, like, curve it out here. I'm like, that's no longer a function if you curve it out there, right? You made it, like, now it doesn't pass the vertical line test. So watch when you draw them. And then <clears throat> 4 drops to 2, and etc cetera, etc cetera. so here's a four let's say that point's going to drop to two now see here's the four came down here that's the exact same x value the y became two right if i go to nine and i drop it down same x value but my nine is going to become a three right because you're square rooting every y so the mapping would be x y becomes x root y so all the y's don't exist so we have to come up with a domain <coughs> The domain is always based off of what's under your square root function, correct? Because what's under your square root can't be what? Negative. So if you have a linear under your square root, this 2x plus 1 is under my square root, then I know 2x plus 1, when it's linear, it's really easy. It has to be greater than or equal to 0. And I subtract my 1. 2x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. Divide by 2 x has to be greater than or equal to negative a half. The only change with um, a linear is that when you go and set it greater than or equal to zero, if you have to divide by a negative, what happens to an inequality sign? It switches. So let's pretend underneath that square root, don't write this because you'll be confused as to why I did it, but say I gave you y equals negative 2x plus 1. I would still take this, I'd go negative 2x plus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0, negative 2x has to be greater than or equal to negative 1, divide by a negative, and now x would have to be less than or equal to negative a half. Less than or equal to. Bring me to the seat. That's hardcore. For I gave tax purpose. I, I, I didn't need a receipt though. So what happened? <laughs> So range, so when you do range of a function and you take square root of it, most often it's greater than or equal to zero, correct? Because I have to start at zero and then I go up, right? Because all the negatives don't exist. But it's not always just greater than zero. Why? Anyone have any ideas? Two of you combined. Both of you kind of don't. Yep. No, nope. because there is no translations down. Everything gets shoved underneath the square root sub function. What kind of graph? What kind of graph could be drawn that you wouldn't just get like? What? Vertex. Are you talking about? That? Oh no, the square root. Nope. Nope, because everything's under the square root, you guys. A parabola, but what would have to happen to it? 
sure. Parabola was a good idea. I liked it. Parabola is a good answer. But something has to happen to the parabola. If the parabola is like this, let's say, if the parabola is like that, it's still going to be 0, 1. It's still going to be 0, 1. And it's still going to curve like this. So my range is still going to be greater than or equal to 0. Correct? If it's like this, this is still going to stay, this is still going to stay. Whoops. This is still going to stay, this is still going to stay. It's going to drop down to like 2, and it's going to curve like this. So my range would be between 0 and 2, let's say. So that'll change my range. If my parabola is concave down, if my parabola is concave down, I'll do it in a different color. If my parabola is concave down, this is going to stay at 0 and 1, right? 0 and 1. So I'm still going to be from greater than 0, but I'm going to be less than the square root of my maximum. Right, because the square root of my maximum is going to drop. So say this is 9. I would take the square root of that, wouldn't I? And now it's going to be at, like, say, 3. This is really drawn to scale, I know. So then my, my range would be between 0 and 3. That would change it, correct? What's another way it could change, though? There's still one more way. still deals with parabolas. That was a good answer. Nope, it has to be a parabola. That means vertical, so up or down. So I drew this one, yep. it doesn't have x-intercepts. If the entire graph is above, so if it's like this, let's say, correct? Say it's above, and say this is at 4. Where is it going to drop to? 2. It would drop to 2, and these will all drop a bit, but it'll just end up like, pretend that's curved. It'll curve out. So it will be y is greater than or equal to 2 right? Not zero. So it really is a parabola function where that parabolic shape where it could be squished between two values if it's concave down and above, or if it's completely above, we're not going to reach zero, correct? We're not going to reach zero. So those are ways to think about it. So let's go down here. We have the graph y equals, uh, or f of x equals 4x minus 3, okay? So how would we get our y values? We could just plug it in. So we get 4 times 0 minus 3, which is negative 3. Then we go 4 times 0.75. Now we're getting out of my echelon. I don't know what kind of that. Which is, oh, it becomes 0. Of course, it's going to be 4 times 3 quarters. And the 4s will cancel. 3 minus 3 is 0. 4 times 0 0.8 minus 3 is 0.2. 4 times 1 is 4 minus 3 is 1. 4 times 2 is 8 minus 3 is 5. 4 times 3 is 12 minus 3 is 9. 5 times 4 is 20 minus 3 is 17. Okay? Now mapping says if I take the entire function and I put it underneath, that means I'm taking all my x's are staying the same, but my y's would be <laughs> square rooted. So all these x's aren't changing, but my y part of the table is going to be square root of negative 3. What's that? Does not exist. I haven't asked her yet. It's on my list. Does not exist. Uh, you could say imaginary, yeah. It's a little i, yeah. They aren't going to want any, like, they're just, it's not going to be drawn, right? So they'll just, you'll just say it doesn't exist, or it's imaginary, or whatever. Okay. Yeah. And then they wouldn't draw it, yeah. And then this one's the square root of zero. Crazy, it stays zero because it's an invariant point. I'm just connecting my letter. Oh my gosh, stop it. And then this one's going to be the square root of point two. Zero point four five. You were off by one hundred. <laughs> um, and this one's square root of one, which is one, so it's invariant. Oh, it's connecting my eyes. It's the next letter. If I take a break, it doesn't. And then square root of five is a little over two. Two point two. 
the square root of 9 is 3, and then square root of 17 is a little over 4. 4.1. Okay, square root of 16 is 4, so that would be just a tiny bit over. So if we sketch the original, it's at 0 and negative 3. I'm going to sketch the original in blue. And then it's at 0.75 and 0. And then it's at 0.8 and 0.2. I'm not sure why I did this before. And then it's at 1 and 1. 2 and 5. 3 and 9. And then 5 and 17. Oh boy. Oh gosh. Let's pretend this is really straight when it's not going to be. Oh, it could have been worse. That's not too bad. So when I go to draw the square root function, I immediately go to where y is 0 and y is 1, and I put a red zone because they're invariant. So here and here will be the same. And I can plot the rest. So I have point A is 0.45, so it's a little bit above. And then at 2, it's going to be at 2.2. And then at 3, it's going to be at 3. And at 5, it's going to be at 4.1. So what's my domain of my inverse, of my inverse, wow, I really went back in time, of my square root function? How can we find it on a, well, we found it at 0.75, but how could we find it if we didn't? Could we just use our calculator and find it? Probably. If not, you'd have to take this, what's underneath here, right? figure it out. Another way you can do it is you're trying to find the x-intercept in this case, correct? So we can find the x-intercept of our original. We don't have to even put it under the square root function. We can just solve it out of here as well because they're going to be the same point. I can plug zero in for either of them and I'll get the same answer. So my domain is going to be x such that x is greater than or equal to 0 0.75 or 3 quarters xdr. Now, if my line was actually going the opposite direction, so say I had a negative slope, my graph would be going in an opposite direction. It would be going like this. Let's say. What would my domain be? It'd be less than because I'd be keeping the part on the other side. Right? So if your linear function is actually um, increasing, your domain will end up being greater than. And if your linear function is decreasing, your, your domain will actually be less than because you're keeping the part before, right? This part will go away and then I would get this curving that way. Not drawn perfectly, but let's pretend. Okay? And so if we want that, we can go square bracket 3 quarters to infinity for interval notation. What's my range of this function? y such that y is greater than or equal to 0. Every linear is going to be greater than or equal to 0. Why? Why? Because it crosses the x-axis. They're going to have to, right? It's linear. It's either going to be um, going downward, but my domain will be less, and my range will still be greater than 0. It has to cross through the x-axis, right? If it has to cross through the x-axis, all the negatives will go away, and I'll start at 0. There's no maxes or mins on these lines, right? So what were the points of intersection? The points of intersection were actually the invariant points, correct? So they were at... Was it 0, 0, and 1, 1? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, 
it was 0 0.75 and 0 and then 1 1 and then how is the x-intercept of the graph of f of x equals 4x minus 3 related to the graph of y equals square root 4x minus 3 they're always going to be the what the same and if one doesn't exist, the other one's not going to exist, right? Or we didn't have x-intercepts on that quadratic I was talking about. You won't have x-intercepts on the other one. These are the same. The x-intercepts are the same because they're invariant, right? Because 0 equals the square root of 0 and y equal zero for x-intercepts. So this one I want you to find the domain and range for these ones. So what would you do first? Always just set, sketch your quadratic. In order to sketch a quadratic you need your mins or maxes. In this case it's a minimum because it's concave up. Correct? You need your x-intercepts. What are some very important points? The mins and maxes on a quadratic, right? The y-intercept, the x-intercept. Also, where y equals what in these cases? Zero and one, because those are going to stay the same, correct? So you need at the very minimum x-intercept, y-intercept, min, maxes, and where x equals zeros and y equals zeros, right? The more points, the more accurate. And I would always make myself my little table like I had above, or not above, on the other page. So x, and then this would be, I guess, f of x, well, let's pretend. And then this one would be square root f of x. So you'd get your all your original points, draw your original graph, correct? And then you'd square root all the y's, draw your new graph. So try that out. Okay, I haven't found the minimum or anything yet. I also haven't found the x-intercepts. But I want to show you something. Does everyone have it in your y equals? Remember I showed you you could go second trace value, x equals, and that gets you the, gives you an x, you get a y, correct? Which is lovely that you can get your y-intercept really easy, but you can't always get corresponding x's that go with y's that way, right? So that's the only way I can put, input an x and get a y, correct? But I want to input a y and get an x. I want to know when my y's are 1 and when my y's are 0, what do I have for invariance, correct? So we know to put in x equals its second trace value, x equals boom. Where is y equals? It's always a trick question. It's the y equals button. People will stand, try and look for it and trace everything. It's just the y equals button. So you go to y equals and you go to y2 and you put in 0. An arrow to the left to that slash slanted line, unless you have the colored graphs, then you don't need to do that. If you don't have the colored graphs, go to your slanted line and hit enter so that you can actually see it grow, show up, correct? So I put in Y2, I put 0. I don't know why I'm showing this on here when I have one on here, but nonetheless, you get it here. Um, and then press graph, and it'll draw a thick line over the x-intercepts, won't it? So now I have two graphs showing up. Do you all have two graphs showing up, everyone? Yes, no? In Y2, make sure you have 0. In Y2, have 0. And then ha go over to that slanted line and make it thicker. Now we have what? Intersections, don't we? So second trace 5. Enter, enter, enter. And you can find out where they intersect. Ready? Nope. And that. Um, I love what I did here. So when your graph is above 0 and 1, a complete quadratic above 0 and 1, so I'm going to take this one out. I'll put it back in a second. Um, if I want it to be above 0 and 1, I can just draw one that's transformed. So I can go, I'm going to make it move over to the 2, 2 to the right, and then squared. And then I have to, oh, fancy. It didn't need, duh, there we go. Um, I need to move it above 1, correct? 
So I can be all trickery and I can go plus 1.1. And it'll look like it has invariance, but it doesn't. People are like, how do I know? Well, I want to look at 1, correct? So if I go 0 to 2, nope, I want to leave that. Why am I touching that? Stop touching that. Here. It doesn't actually cross it, does it? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes there's no invariant points. Sometimes there's one invariant point. How would that happen? The vertex is on the one or the vertex is on the zero. And actually there's no points left at all it has. So if it was like this, zoom six. If I just had negative x squared, let's say. I'd have one invariant point, and I'd actually only have one point. My domain would be zero. My range would be zero. My invariant point would be zero, zero. I'd have nothing. <laughs> yeah. Explain why. It could. So do you see how you could get different things? Now in this graph, I'll go back to this one, which was x squared plus x plus minus 5. There's my invariance. I'm going to show you now. I could go like this. Second square root x squared plus x minus 5. It actually causes it to curve, correct? It goes this way and it goes this way. That pink one is actually what the square root function becomes, correct? So my domain is going to be less than or equal to my x-intercept. And or x is greater than or equal to my x-intercept. So I have to find my x-intercepts in order to get my domain. Does that make sense? So when you write your domain out, it would be, it wouldn't write. That's what it would do. It would be it's early. Shocking. Uh, hero cookie. If I had one, you'd get it. Okay, so if it would be x, that's sarcasm. X is such that it would be less than or equal to my x-intercept or x is greater than or equal to my other one. You have to use or. You can't use and. It makes no sense. If you're saying x is less than 1 and x is greater than 1, is that even possible? Is there a number in the world that's less than 1 and or less than negative 1 and greater than 1, let's say? No. So you need the word or in between. Okay? Okay.